You know, yesterday we heard about many of the problems associated with, um, from the large sectors of the U.S. associated with decades of some not so good practices sometimes, uh, maybe old habits, some policies were lack thereof, associated with the use of our lands and the soils. And today we want to focus a little more sharply on the issue of water and some of those solutions that we feel everybody can participate in at some kind of level. Um, just a quick show of hands, how many people here in the last year spent time on, on the water, river, lake, whatever, doing whatever? Oh boy, isn't that great? <laughs> I did too. Um, we all had those great memories. Uh, growing up, going to the lake with families, and spending time on the rivers, fishing with families and their dad and whatever. Um, but uh, we're seeing an increasingly number of instances where we go with our, our favorite lake, our favorite favorite uh, reservoir to fish or whatever, swim, and there might be a sign posted, closed because of E. coli or whatever. Uh, just this past week, the Iowa DNR issued five new warnings, which is pretty much a weekly occurrence. Uh, warnings about beaches being closed because of either E. coli or blue-green algae, and that's becoming all too common. And uh, so obviously these are major concerns for a lot of people. We want to do things to help address that. And today, some of the panel speakers are going to talk about the things that they're doing and that will help uh, help alleviate those problems and get you engaged. So, um, first panel, first panel is Mary Skolpak. Dr. Mary Skolpak, she's the executive director of Iowa Lakeside Laboratory, and she led the Volunteer of the Water, Iowa Waters Program uh, for the DNR for several years, and uh, for 11 years, actually, and has, for decades, had uh, lots of experience in training and mobilizing volunteers in, across Iowa and nationwide, and uh, I will turn it over to Mary. today about uh, citizen science and uh, engaging people and hopefully uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that you can do. Um, how many folks are training Save Our Streams people in the audience? Okay, so this is going to be somewhat of a review for you. <clears throat> but what can an average citizen contribute and how can we engage people? Um, if we oh, again. Oh, there it is. It might not be on. All right, technology. <laughs> okay. No, good. All right. So, talked a little bit about the Iowa Water Program. I know Sam referenced it in her presentation. Iowa Water was a citizen science program that came out of the Iowa DNR, um, but really loosely based on the Save Our Streams protocol. And since 1999, we've trained more than 5,000 volunteers. Unfortunately, the funding for Iowa Water sort of disappeared and the Iowa DNR is no longer supporting Iowa Water. But I think that's a really good model in terms of talking about citizen engagement when we look at the Iowa Water program. Um, if you think about the, the mission statement of Iowa Water, I think the really important part of that mission statement is that last sentence, which really looks at how do we understand aquatic resources and that active monitoring really engaging the volunteer to think more deeply about the resources that are out there testing. Um, I water is much like a sailor stream workshop. You attend a workshop, you learn the basics of monitoring, uh, you get the equipment, you go outside, you start to monitor that resource. Um, but there's a lot more to that. And, and when you think about the act of actually going to that site, looking at that water, thinking more deeply about the water, you're engaging in ways that maybe you don't even think that you're engaging about. It's not just simply taking that water sample and getting that nitrogen or phosphorus reading. It's thinking about that water more deeply as you're standing there. It also has a huge contribution to society. I think Bonnie will talk a little bit more about this stuff. Um, but it, it contributes lots and lots of data. If we look at the Iowa Water Program, more than 10,000 data records were submitted over 20 years. And that's a lot of information. It's much more information, actually, than the Iowa DNR was collecting on many of these streams and was really getting information where we need it the most, which is in those really small streams. The Des Moines River, the Iowa River, the Skunk River had regular monitoring, but we weren't getting 
information on those little tributaries where we would maybe see improvements first. Um, if you think about the scientists that then need information to understand water quality improvements, they were also able to mine the eye water data to look at how things were changing over time. The question always came up, do citizens produce good data? And I can tell you without a doubt that they do. There's lots and lots of studies that show that citizens produce good data um, when trained correctly. And we also need to think about that the information that they're generating is not necessarily as precise as a laboratory measurement, but it's really accurate pictures of water quality. So hopefully we can put that question aside that citizens can produce good data and can make good uh, information from their data. And so for me, when I think about iWater, when we think about citizen science, it's not just the data though, it's the information that's being produced. So we're thinking about the citizen is getting immediate feedback. When you put that test strip in the water, you pull it out and it's turned pink, for example, with nitrate, you get that immediate result that you're seeing high nitrate levels in that stream. And that's a really important kind of skill building, knowledge building component that is sometimes, I think, um, not, not understood that that citizen is getting that immediate feedback and really um, kind of internalizing that water quality information. At the same time, I think it also closes the gap between what's happening on the landscape. So if somebody is doing a practice on their land, they're maybe putting in a cover crop, now we need to understand how that cover crop is immediately changing the water quality. If I'm in a 10,000 acre watershed, I may not see that right away. If I'm right there by that stream, by that tile line, I'm getting that immediate feedback, which I think we really, really need to do and to, to close that gap for people. Um, it also helps citizens connect with their community and their decision makers. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, I want to take a quick little detour into the Cooperative Area Lake Monitoring Program, which is from the Okaboji area where Lakeside is at. Um, also a 20-year monitoring program, engaging citizens to look at lake resources, um, they monitor 27 sites over the year um, and seven times a year. So about three times more frequent than the Iowa DNR would monitor these lake resources. Again, there's thousands and thousands of data points that have been collected from these citizen lake monitors. And doing the very same measurements that you can see in most uh, typical water quality monitoring programs, everything from nitrogen, phosphorus, and water clarity, uh, as well as algae and that kind of thing. Um, the data is available if anybody wants to take a look at that. I can share that with you later. But how are the plant data used? Much like most, much of the other data that are used from iWater, we're tracking changes through time, but then we're also using that information to assess where we want to go. So have the lakes improved? And if they're not improving, how do we want to get there in terms of reducing um, algae levels and getting better water clarity? And the data has really energized and engaged the water quality community. Um, we will have a conference in two weeks, if anybody's interested, that's in the Iowa area. Come up and see some of the plant data that's been produced over 20 years. One of the really exciting things is we've seen dramatic decreases in phosphorus levels in our lakes, in the Iowa Great Lakes, um, as a result of investments in water quality improvement from either putting in cover crops or putting in native prairies or putting in wetlands. In 20 years, we've seen reductions in phosphorus that are significant. And so when people think that they can't make a difference, I can show this data to them and say, no, no, you need to keep investing in this community because you're seeing those results and we're seeing really amazing results coming from the Iowa Great Lakes. The other thing that I think is really important and for all of you that are SOS volunteers or out doing water quality monitoring is to understand the impact on volunteers that isn't often understood. Um, you're getting some technical skills but the question is, are you getting skills that help to build that community and engagement further uh, beyond your individual uh, circle of people? Again, if we look at the mission of Iowa Water, it was to support and encourage growth and networking of Iowa volunteer water monitoring communities. So the question came up, are we really building partnership skills? Are we helping volunteers to take it to the next level, to take it to the next step? And so we did some, and if you look at what kind of partnerships that might be or what kind of skills you might want people to engage with, it would be, can they get involved in a watershed management program? Can they get involved in a watershed management authority or association? Can they be working with decision makers? And so we really looked at, you know, how do new volunteers come into volunteer water quality monitoring? They're getting some skills or maybe learning from somebody. I know Sam said, bring a friend to go out monitoring. Is that how people are learning? How does that work on improving um, the, the base of partnership in the water monitoring landscape? 
So from a water perspective or from a plant perspective, we know that we get direct instruction. They're sitting at that, that watershed meeting, um, they're learning how to do water quality testing with those test kits. The question is, are they learning partnership skills? Because we aren't directly telling them how to partner with other people, how to go to a, a watershed meeting, how to go to a city council meeting and actually start talking about what they've learned. Have they picked that up or not? And so we really wanted to assess that. And we did a quick program survey of Iowa State to look at our volunteers. We took about uh, 1,700 volunteers and asked them how they were at partnership building. Um, if you look at the Iowa Water Volunteer sort of demographics, the majority have been doing monitoring for either um, at least uh, four years, but many of them have been doing monitoring for you know, eight to 10 years. Um, so we asked them how long you've been monitoring and then how good are you at different things? on a scale to one to five. So we asked them, are you able to network with others? And you see a significant growth after our water to be able to network with other people. Um, what I think is significant is the number of people who are willing to talk to their family really increases. So now you can start to have that kind of uncomfortable Thanksgiving discussion about water quality, that you're an expert on water quality, and you're comfortable talking to your family members, as well as talking to colleagues about water quality monitoring. Um, that significant growth is something that we didn't intend to do in the program, but it's an outgrowth of being engaged in a volunteer monitoring world. Um, networking is very difficult, but we ask people how hard is it or how easy is it to network with other members of water quality groups. Before Iowa Water, it was very hard or hard. Half the people said that. After they became involved with Iowa Water, only 15% said that. So now we're seeing that people feel like they've got competence, they feel like they can be engaged just because they became trained in eye water. No specific networking training was happening, it was just that act of monitoring. And then what we asked is, how has is, how is eye water helped you do something? Um, we saw a significant number of people involved in watershed groups, participating in cleanup days, joining other conservation groups like ICE, um, or joining a paddling group. And then one of the things that was really fun to see is the number of people who stepped up into leadership roles through the Iowa Water Program. It's not a huge number of people, 6% looking at organizing watershed authority, but they were really starting to think about organizing within their watershed. And again, those are things that I think are really kind of a take home message that people need to understand that if you bring your friends along to a Save Our Streams um, monitoring day, the kinds of growth that those people may experience are things that are, are beyond what you might initially anticipate are going to happen with them. Um, I ran through that really quickly, so we have got lots of time for discussion, but thanks for listening to me, and we'll take questions after the other panels. Thank you, Mary. Um, we're very pleased to have Bonnie McGill here with us today. Um, I first met Bonnie last fall. I'm going to chapter meeting one night. We had a nice conversation. Um, you can read her bio in your program. There's a couple of sentences in that uh, that she said to me also that I think is really interesting and I, I, I want to share with you. Um, Bonnie works at the intersection of agriculture, climate change, and water resources to understand how conservation and agricultural watershed affects water quality greenhouse gases. She integrates sociology with ecology to understand the human dimensions of nutrient cycling to better inform models and conservation policy. I just find that really fascinating and I'm really looking forward to hearing what she has to say. So, honey, please come up.
streams is due to an individual farmer's attitudes and beliefs. None of the pollution. How many people here think that some of the nitrate pollution here is due to the attitudes and beliefs of the individual farmers? How many people here think that the vast majority of the nitrate pollution in our rivers in the Midwest is due to individual farmers' attitudes and beliefs? curve there. Well, my, my confession to you is that I used to be um, part of that last group. I thought that the best way to reduce nitrate pollution in our rivers and streams was to change the hearts and minds of farmers to understand what their impact is on the environment. Um, and that was the best way to move forward towards our conservation goals. And while I do believe that that is an important part of the conversation about conservation, I think that that conveniently leaves out some other big players who have a role to play in how that nitrate gets into our river. So that's what I'm here to talk about with you today and also share my science in trying to further understand this problem. So I'm going to start with Nate's story. The poor old girl. Those are the words that Nate uses to describe Prairie Creek, which is part of the Boone River that ultimately goes into the Des Moines River. Um, as part of the Des Moines drinking water supply. He is the son and grandson of Iowa farmers, and he grows corn and soybeans on about 1,300 acres of prime Iowa farmland. He uses those words to describe his river because he's seen it change over the course of his lifetime. It's become more, it looks more like chocolate milk, and the flow regime is more like a toilet bowl flush, rising up very quickly and receding very quickly than like a healthy prairie stream. Nate attributes those changes that he has seen to what's happening upstream of him. He says that upstream he sees a lot of tillage, not enough cover crops, and more and more tile drains going in every year. That leads to soil erosion and also really flashy rivers. And the fishermen, uh, the anglers in the room know that that's not uh, healthy for fish habitat, that's not good for wildlife habitat, or for people source water for drinking. Um, and so he's looked at his own acres along Prairie Creek and said, well, what can I do about this? I am upstream of someone else. So he ultimately chose conservation. He's proud to tell you about his acres along the stream that he's enrolled in the Conservation Reserve Program, or CRP. Now, you and I are paying me for those CRP acres. What are we getting out of it? Well, now they're planted in perennial grasses and, and woody vegetation along the riparian area. So that's in the winter, or all year long, you have live roots in the ground, and that's helping to hold on to that precious soil when it rains. It's also helping the soil store more water, so it's not immediately going downstream. It's also holding on to some of that excess nitrogen from fertilizer and manure. So, um, in that situation, then, how does that, who's responsible for that nitrogen getting into the river? I would say that, yes, some of that is due to the farmer's attitudes and beliefs, for sure. But let's talk about who else has a role to play, how that, and how that nitrogen gets into Prairie Creek, into the Des Moines River, into the Mississippi River, and into the Gulf of Mexico. Well, let's talk about landlords. They want their cash rent, right? And so they might not be encouraging conservation practices on the land that the farmer is renting. Banks, farmers have to go to get loans every year to pay for their inputs. And so loans might be structured um, so that a farmer can't implement certain conservation practices. And how about Congress and the ag industry, right? They structure the farm bill, the profit insurance, and all these incentives for how farmers make decisions. And this all creates a space within which it can be hard for a farmer to choose conservation. Now, I'm not trying to make you feel like, oh, the poor old farmer, you know, that, that's definitely not the case here. But just to say, some of that burden needs to be shared by others. And then also, let's look at ourselves, right? So how many people in the room have eaten meat from a fast food restaurant or bought cheap meat from a big chain grocery store in the last week? Come on. All right, so we all have really a role to play um, in that nitrogen in the river because those low crop prices that big ag, big ag wants and that Congress helps provide support the livestock industry and making ethanol, not really feeding the world there, 
um, and that makes it so that farmers have to grow as much crop yield from each acre and from more acres in order to make the same amount of uh, a living as they, as they did 20 years ago. So let's talk a little more about the nitrogen problem. Um, well, I guess the last thing on that last slide that I wanted to say then, so if that's the case, if these other players have a role in that nitrogen getting into the river, why is our best policy um, in, call for reducing this nitrogen pollution and asking farmers to implement voluntary conservation practices? We're not making it hard for um, the industry, the banks, or anyone else to do anything. So that's my rhetorical question that we'll get into some more. But let's talk a little more about the nitrogen problem and why it's so fascinating here in Iowa. So what you're looking at, outlined in black, is the entire Mississippi River watershed. It's huge. Iowa only makes up 4.5% of the land area. It contributes 6% of the water flow to the river, and yet 29% of the nitrate pollution that reaches the mouth of the Mississippi River comes from Iowa. If we look just at that blue area, that's the upper Mississippi River Basin, Iowa contributes almost half of the nitrate pollution. And then if we look to the west, you have the brown area, that's the Missouri River Basin, that the western part of Iowa contributes 55% of that basin's nitrate pollution. So Iowa has an outsized effect on the pollution problem. 34%, that's the amount that the average nitrate load in the river increased in 2013. So you remember in 2012, we had that really bad drought, and all that fertilizer just sat there. It wasn't able to be taken up by the crops. And then we had a very really wet spring in 2013. We called the news media called that a weather whiplash, going from one extreme to the other. And so what that created was about a third more nitrate pollution that year than normal. And you should know that that type of weather whiplash event, those will increase in intensity and frequency as the climate continues to change. According to the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy, um, in order to meet our uh, nitrate pollution reduction goals, we have to have 60% of the state's cropland covered in cover crops. And the very latest numbers show that we are just now squeaking up to 4%. $420 million is the amount of state and federal tax dollars that were spent in 2017 on water quality conservation practices in the state of Iowa. That same year, the ag industry made $9.4 billion by utilizing our natural resources. So given all of these difficult issues, what can I as an ecologist do? Well, my research question essentially boils down to how much do agricultural conservation practices and other drivers of nitrogen pollution, like tile drains, climate change, and um, feedlot operations, animal feedlot operations, affect nitrate pollution in Iowa rivers? In other words, are we comparing apples to apples? Are cover crops, are more bioreactors, are those of the same scale and magnitude as changes in nitrate pollution due to things like a four-inch rain in two hours, more and more pattern tile going into fields, and new animal feedlot operations going in every year? Or are we really comparing peanuts to elephants? So I don't know the answer to that. That's to be determined. Um, so I don't like going out talking about peanuts and elephants. But um, I just wanted to use that to frame my question. I'm about a year into a two-year uh, project here. And so hopefully in the next few months, I'll have a better answer for that question. But let me tell you what I'm doing about it. Um, so I have a watershed, computer-based watershed model. Don't worry, I'm going to very briefly tell you about this exciting computer model. Um, but basically, it breaks the watershed into fields, and for that field, it knows the slope and the soil type. And then on top of that, you can give it all kinds of spatial information. And if it's ag land, I can tell it what's being planted when, what type of fertilizer, where you fertilize, where you harvest it, if you're using manure or not, what kind of tillage, all that kind of information. And on top of that, I can put daily weather information. And so I can go back in time. What ultimately the model gives me is it predicts the nitrate load in the river at the same place where the USGS or the University of Iowa have had nitrate sensors in the river going back over 10 years in some places. That's a really powerful data set. 
Um, and so I can use that to calibrate my model, but also then to understand what management practices, where in the watershed, what types of weather events were causing some of the patterns we've seen in the past with nitrate. But then the other cool, powerful thing that we as scientists can bring that's useful to society is predictions. So I can also give the model future climate change scenarios and future management scenarios to then say, okay, policymakers, if we had account for climate change and we implement these types of conservation practices, this is how long it will take us to reach this water quality goal. Or if we don't change and we just do business as usual, this is how long it will take. So that's what I'm ultimately trying to get to. And I just want to tell you about three novel types of data that I'm incorporating into my model to better understand this issue. And that's people, poop, and satellites. So as an ecosystem ecologist, I'm a little bit weird in that I believe we need to talk to people to understand what's happening in our ecosystems. And that's very true in the agricultural landscape. And so this past winter, I did focus groups with a total of 38 farmers in the Boone and Raccoon River watersheds here in Iowa. My main goal was really to understand of the biggest nitrogen reduction conservation practices, what are they using now, and how will that change with the climate scenario. So I can directly feed that into my model, and people can't really uh, criticize my results and say, well, you don't know that's what's going to happen. You just made that up at your computer, which is normally what us modelers do. Um, but I can say, no, actually, I intensify the tile drainage in all of my future scenarios because all of the farmers said that's what they're doing. Um, so I'm just going to give you a few quotes to give you just a few of the flavors of what our conversations were like. There was a bit of climate change denial. So people saying things like, I've got great-grandfather's diaries, and they talk about weather extremes in the 1800s. Which is true, we've always had weather extremes, but now it's intensifying in frequency and this sort of long-term trend. Um, but I wasn't there to teach them about climate change. I was just there to understand what their perceptions are. And then we had climate change agreement. People, especially true when we talked about precipitation and the winter changes that people have seen. So someone said, my dad always talked about everybody had snowmobiles. Hardly anybody has a snowmobile in Iowa anymore. And the group really agreed with that. And someone responded saying, I'm a very discouraged snowmobile, I'm a very discouraged member of a snowmobile club based out of Panora. So that's kind of a light comment, but showing like that's an actual real thing you can look at is how much are people using snowmobiles. And we all, what also came up with reasons for more tile that people are putting in. So one person said, and more tile. That's I mean everybody's response to the heavy rains and the wet weather. So moving on to the second type of data that I'm using is poop. Um, it's actually not very new for this type of model, but we're updating it for the state of Iowa. The last time this type of map was made by the DNR was in 2006. And basically what you're looking at on the left is the latest map from 2006, where they take um, each red dot it is where an animal feedlot operation is, and the brown circle around it is the estimated area of where manure is applied calculated by how much livestock and what type of livestock and how much manure is produced. So that hasn't been done for a while, so I'm going to update that for 2018. And uh, what you can kind of see is that I've just added the new feedlot operation dots, which is kind of hard to see, but it's like more empty here, a lot more here, and I haven't added the brown manure circles yet, so you can imagine that you can get a lot more brown on that map. Um, over that time period, Iowa gets about 270 new animal feedlot operations every year. And then third is satellites. So we used to be, people like me, in order to get spatial information about where conservation practices are happening on the landscape, um, you're kind of limited because even though taxpayers are paying for these conservation practices, the USDA protects the privacy of landowners and wouldn't share those maps with us. But now we can just get around that and look at it from outer space and see certain structural practices um, and management practices like cover crops. So now we're working on mapping where those cover crops are. Um, and I worked with my USGS mentor, Dr. Dean Hively, this past winter, and a technician from uh, the University of Kansas who went out and ground truth um, some of the, the cover crops in Iowa. So finally, what are the next steps? Well, for me, I need to get all this data together and get this model so I can actually give you results and not just tell you about it. Um, and share that with uh, policymakers, the public, and with farmers. A lot of them were really interested in what I was doing. 
Now you might be thinking, well, I'm not a farmer, so I, I, I can't really help with this. Well, but actually, by being active with the ICE in the Save Our Stream program that Sam was talking about, um, that those national water quality databases that you're uploading your data to is something that uh, myself and my colleagues frequently use those databases. So know that it is very valuable when used. Um, and whatever you're, where you live, you live in a watershed. So there's a group, or maybe you should start one. Vote for legislators who are pro-conservation. First of all, vote. Second of all, see what their attitudes are about conservation. If you're a landowner, talk to your tenant about conservation practices you want. Sociological um, research has shown that it's actually more effective for the landowner to bring it up to the tenant than for the tenant to bring it up to you. They don't want to uh, mess up any of the dynamics in terms of getting that lease. So it, it seems to work better if you can bring it up to them. If you're a banker, what type of farming does your loans, do your loans enable? Or are they enabling conservation or pollution? And also consider your role in water pollution and greenhouse gas emissions by way of buying cheap meat. Um, consider eating meat less often, more sustainably raised. Vote with your wallet. And maybe one of the biggest things you can do is teach your kids and grandkids about nature and get them excited about going outside. Probably all of us are sitting in this room today because we had some kind of experience like this right when we were kids. Um, so that now we're the ones protecting and standing up for the environment to make sure that um, the young kids are able to do that too. And so not just taking them to like national parks out west and stuff like that, but get them excited about the beauty of places like Iowa and what resources that we have. So I'll just leave you um, with this idea that one mate cannot solve the nitrate pollution problem, but thousands of mates can save a river. And what I'm trying to do is, is to provide science for it, more science-based policy to make it easier for more farmers to choose conservation. And I look forward to our panel discussion where I can hear your questions and ideas about reinventing the system. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Sounds like we need to have you back. Thank you get some of these questions answered about uh, some of your research. That sounds pretty exciting. Um, <clears throat> so my next guest um, very graciously filled in for us at the very last minute. Unfortunately, Seth Watkins had to cancel at the last minute, late last week because of a family medical emergency, and uh, we had to do some scrambling. Um, but I believe we found a very viable substitute for Seth uh, in the name of Bruce Carney. Um, and, and, and segueing off of one of Bonnie's last points about uh, eating sustainable meat, Seth's got a good message, or excuse me, Bruce has a good message that he's going to talk about. So briefly, uh, Bruce Carney was in the middle of a long career uh, as a union carpenter and commercial construction superintendent for the Whites Corporation here in Des Moines. When, after a sudden passing of his father in 1996, he found himself returning to his family farm near Maxwell, Iowa, which is just north east of here, less than half an hour. At that time, it was a 300-acre farm with 200 acres in conventional row crops and 100 acres in permanent pasture, where his father ran a 70-head cow-calf direct work market grain finished beef operation. By 2008, Bruce had eliminated all the row crops and converted the entire 300 acres to permanent pasture. He also rented another 200 acres of additional permanent pasture and began to forage, finishing all of his beef. Today, he still owns that same 300 acres and rents an additional 300 rented, uh, permanent acres of permanent pasture, where he conservation graces a, a 125 head cow calf operation, and he also has pork and poultry. And uh, direct markets uh, most of his meat through local lockers and uh, those kind of markets where you can find it. He also sells forage based seed stock, and he's proud of the fact that his beef is all naturally fed with no antibiotics, growth hormones, or GMO inputs. He continued to work for the Whites Corporation up until 2013 when he retired so he could devote all of his time to his beef operation and the family farm where he and 
Connie, his wife of 33 years, live to this day. They are the proud parents of three grown children and seven grandchildren. Again, thank you, Bruce, for coming out and joining us today. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to have to follow this because they've got it all figured out. <laughs> it took me a long time to figure that all out. And I'm sure I don't have it. But, uh, and, and I think all the things I was going to talk about was in my bio. So I'm going to try to talk a little bit about why I did some of the things I did and why I made the changes I made. He talked about the 300 acre farm. Uh, I just kind of picked up where my dad left off and did what he did for a few years until I decided, you know, these chemicals and these eye inputs and all this stuff that they want me to do, I, I really don't like it. I don't like this stuff. I, I honestly think we go to hy -Vee, and that could be whatever grocery stores in your state. hy is the big one here, right? And you buy your death in a box on the shelf. You just don't know what disease you're buying or when you're going to get it or any of that, they don't advertise it. They just stick it in the box for you. So I think our food system is really screwed up. Uh, and, and that's not because I've had any bad thing happen in our family or anything. I mean, we've had diseases, cancer, and you know, heart disease and stuff like that. It's it just, that, that's just my thought, so I have to get away from all these chemicals and, and high inputs and all this stuff. When I started to have to go to the bank and buy 200 acres of, of crop, that was too much for me. I'm not going to go borrow money every year just to pay it back at the end of the year. So I had to make some changes. And, and I can remember the conversation I went to my mom and I said, hey mom, what do you think about uh, seeding this whole farm down and just raising livestock on it? And the comment was, well, that's what your dad wanted to do. Sorry. That's what we're moving forward with. <coughs> so then we moved from there, right? We got out of the crop business in 2008, and my bins were full of corn, so I was feeding corn to cows and selling grass finished beef, or I mean corn finished beef. But then the price went to $7, right? Six, seven dollars for corn. And my bin was empty, so what am I going to do? I'm not going to buy a $7 corn from somebody else and I'm not raising it. So I decided, okay, we're just going to grass finish beef and that here's where we are, okay? And we've picked up from beef to lamb to poultry to, to pork. We do all of it on pasture and, 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 and try to do it naturally. So uh, one of the things I picked up on here on both speakers was, was uh, citizen scientists, is that what you call them? Uh, in Iowa, Probably some of these people in Iowa are practical farmers of Iowa. That's what that whole group is, the citizen scientists. And if you haven't been there, go to Practical Farmers of Iowa's website, you can see what they do. But they do a lot of, a lot of research on farms. What, whatever the question you have, they'll help you set up the, the research and, and uh, get the answer from it. I, I went through with my son in the Iowa and we, we did some testing on our farm above a feedlot, below a feedlot, and, and seen what we would do with the water. And we have very few animals in a feedlot anymore. So that, that kind of told me that this isn't working, it's not the right spot, we're not going to do this, which helped make those decisions as well. Uh, we've done some. Uh, uh, Sure, I just lost it. The other research I talked about. Oh, bird, bird monitoring. We've, we've been doing a lot of bird monitoring on the farm that you can see there for the last four years with Drake University and Practical Farmers of Iowa. And, and we're comparing the farm and the, and the forages and, and the high management, rotation of grazing and all that with what Chautauqua Wildlife Area has, which is a 10,000 acre wildlife area that's right next to me. And we have. Uh, the, the five species that we're looking at, we did we have more on, on the farm, 300 acre grass farm than they do in these plots that they're measuring down at Chautauqua. Just because of the diversity in the grass and the management of it, it's different because their management is, it's either 10 foot tall, it's mowed off or it's burned off. And birds like a little bit of everything. So 
Uh, a lot of the things, I guess, I'm just trying to point out some of the things that we're doing and, and some of the research that we've done out on the farm that uh, you can go look at and, and get the, the results of. The other one is, is water monitoring. We, we did a tile monitor, monitoring, went through Ohio Soybean Association, and we monitored a tile that dumped on, from my farm that was all covered in grass and forage and compared it to crop ground that was all crop, 100% crop ground. And the parts per million nit nitrates never got above one. Uh, off, off of my farm, and they never got below 17 off the crop ground. So th there's a huge difference, and, and we all have we, we all have to go somewhere and do something here to make this better. Uh, I agree with the, the, the other people that are involved here. I think a big one is Congress. I think it's policy. We've they've created a welfare system for farmers, and they're just going to do what they have to do with, with what they give them to do, and I'm not trying to stick up for them because I don't like it. Okay, but they have to stay financially stable too or they're not going to be in business either. So I think policy is a big piece of it that, that has to change to, uh, to change some of this. Um, I, I've lived here my whole life. Uh, I'm not sure the volunteer system that we got set up here in Iowa is going to work. It's, it's, uh, Everybody's trying, but when, when we're all broke and we don't make the money, how are we going to put cover crops in and how are we going to do all those things? So, and, and I don't think we need more welfare to get it done. I think my personal opinion is if you can't afford to take care of your land, you shouldn't own it. So, I, I don't think what we have is what we need. Uh, it, it needs to change, but I think government has to help change that. So uh, maybe I'll look at some of the slides. The other thing I want to talk about a little bit was going through all this and going from crop ground to pasture ground and doing this grazing system. I used all the government programs to do that. And I really struggled the first time of signing the contract because I didn't want their money. I didn't want them to have any control over me. I didn't want to do anything. But over the years, I've kind of figured out that, you know what, this is the system I live in today. So I just need to use it and, and try to improve my system, my little piece of the world, my name, okay? It's just Bruce in, in my case, but uh, it, uh, That's it. That's all of it. So, so I, used, I used all the money I could get. I've done Equip, I've done CRP in my crits, which is a lot of the pictures that you're seeing scroll through here. Uh, I planted, I don't know how many trees, 10 or 15,000 trees on 300 acres. We planted a lot of trees, so there's that, that, that's a picture of my crib that comes from my farm. It's been at CRP for 15 years. It came out last fall. I'm planning on grazing this. That'll probably turn some of your stomachs, but it will get conservation grazed. I'll probably graze it twice a year, maybe. Maybe in July and August, I'll run in there and, and really quick flash graze it, bring the cows out, and, and then probably in the dormant season, I'll stop pile and use it for uh, stock pile feed in the wintertime. I think I can manage it. I think I, I think it needs some disturbance. 100% rest doesn't work either. So those are some of the things I guess I wanted to talk about. Uh, maybe I'll just let them get the question and answers and we'll, and they can bring some